All right, guys, uh, just uh, let's go over the questions. Let's see. So question number one, essentially a very annoying question, I think, right? But uh, how do you solve it? At least uh, uh, what what the right solution for it? Well, you see, let's assume that spaces don't matter. Imagine they're just one string. Spaces don't matter. I just wrote up the spaces so you can read it. And so as one string, uh, I just count uh, how many letters of each type there are. So for instance, there are, uh, in this case, five uh, letters. And those five letters, uh, uh, D, X, L, R, and U appear once. You agree? And then uh, uh, there's then I see which how many letters uh, what which which are the letters that appear two times or three times or four times and onwards. So there is going to be six uh, letters, and those letters are O, N, C, M, I, G, that appear twice. And uh, then there are uh, two letters. Those letters are H and S. They appear three times. Then uh, one letter, that's uh, letter A. It's four times. Then uh, two, letters te they appear six times and uh, that's it that's all i have yes so then how do i imagine the situation i imagine for each position there is an indicator variable so the first position it's the indicator variable is for the letter d right it's either d or not d you agree? And for the second position, it's either O or not O. So for a letter to be in proper place in position one, it means it has to be a D letter. Yes? So then I add up uh, over the indicator on the variable. So there's X1 all the way to O together, how many letters you have. It's this, uh, this is the sum of those, um, those letters. There are 39 letters in total, right? So there are 39 letters. So there, uh, for, there are 39 random variables which are equal to one or zero. And, the, and you add them up, right? So each time you add a one, it means that you found a letter in its proper place. So uh, then by grouping it this way, I can see, okay, so, so there are going to be five indicator uh, random variables, right? Uh, in, in uh, Not actually five, sorry. So, um, they are going to be uh, in five positions. They are going to be D letter indicator variables. In five, uh, uh, sorry, in, in one position there is a D letter, and uh, in another there is a, there is there is the X letter, right? So those are the single uh, letter types. And for them, I add five times one squared divided by thirty nine. one squared divided by uh, 39. Yes, you see why, uh, where's the one squared uh, coming from? So, uh, because uh, what you do is, uh, it, it is, it is, uh, uh, so in proper position, it is, it, is, uh, it is one out of 39 for D for instance, right? One out of 39 is, uh, the, is what uh, this uh, D, um, brings then uh, let's say and then there are five uh, five of those types now the next is there are six uh, uh the, 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 those are this this is the six right and those appear twice so all appears twice and appears twice right so uh, so there are six uh, uh, places where all uh, will appear now how much uh, are we going to add uh, uh, for, for each of so for instance for the first instance of all 
uh, if, if it's in proper place, then the probability is two out of 39. And that's what you're adding, right? And then for the other O, you're also adding two. Uh, so for the other place where you have an O, right? You're also, uh, so basically each of those letters, they appear six times. For each of them, it's six times. You see uh, how I group it. So, the, so there is this O, it's, uh, its indicator is adding six, it's adding two over 39 when it's in proper place. That's the expected value of this O. And on this O, it's also two over 39. So together it's two plus two. When you add two to itself twice, it's uh, two is the same thing as actually two squared in this case, you see? And the same will happen for all the other letters, N, C, M, and whatever. So it will be six times I add uh, two over 39 and two over 39, which ends up being the same as two squared over 39. You see? Because six times this this is uh, this is uh, twice this is twice this is twice this is twice and and since for them it's the same expected value I just multiply the expected value of uh, the O of the summation of O by six so it's two over thirty nine plus another O it's two over thirty nine are you with me so far that's why I wrote it as a square uh, it, it, it's it's easy to miss that square for instance. Then uh, the next thing is uh, I see there are two letters that appear three times. So then I, I add to the plus two. Now those letters, the two plus two, so I just now consider H, right? So H appears three times. So uh, the, fir the, the first place where you see an H, it's uh, three over 39 is the expected value. So it's three over 39. The next place you see, uh, you see an H is again three, over 39, so it's three over 39 plus three over 39. And there is going to be a third place where it's three over 39. So altogether it's three plus three plus three, three added to itself three times is three squared. So it will be three squared over 39. Yes, good, good. You understand, what, you understand how I, I just grouped it, but really, it's just uh, 39 random variables and in each place, I just see how many uh, times it repeats. I just grouped it in this way so that it's easier to add. And, uh, and then you continue onwards. Now A appears four times. So there is only one thing that appears four times. So I, I, I will just add this. So first time I see an A, let's say here, it's uh, four over 39, it's expected value plus four over expect uh, four, four over 39 plus four over 39. So I add a four to itself four times. So it ends up being the same as four squared over 39, you see? So I just regroup the random variables and I add them like this, right? And then of course, there is one more thing that some letter appears uh, six times. There are two letters that appear six times. So that would be plus two times uh, uh, six squared over 39. And that equals to 135 over 39. It's a fraction. Yes. That's how many times that happens. So that's the solution to problem one. Let me know if you have any additional questions to it. No? So then I move on. All right. Uh, question number two. So it's actually a true story in some sense. So uh, what you have is uh, you have a pizza. Yes, and then we need to understand uh, uh, what's the probability that pepperoni, there are end slices of pepperoni, they are scattered on half the pizza. So for that, maybe here, let's draw the pizza. And uh, let's draw uh, pepperoni slices. I can always assume they are uh, different individual pepperoni slices and therefore there is pepperoni slice one, pepperoni slice two, pepperoni slice three and so on, right? So imagine that you see a scattering uh, of pepperoni, uh, of pepperoni slices, here is one, here is another, here is another, here is another. So it looks like if I uh, begin from this pepperoni slice and rotate counterclockwise, I sweep away half the pie and uh, that's the only half that contains pepperoni slices, right? So, you, you, so what happens is that if you have this, uh, if, if it happens that exactly half of the uh, pizza is covered by pepperoni, it means that there exists a unique, uh, uh, unique pepperoni piece 
such that if you swipe counterclockwise from that unique pepperoni uh, piece, you will uh, cut half the pie and, the, and not get any other pepperoni pieces on the other part, yes? So what it means, so, so uh, we can say this is the probability that we see half is the probability that we see uh, half starting from slice one plus the probability that we see half starting from slice two and all the, way, all the way to the probability that we see half starting from slice n. You agree? So in other words, uh, half of this uh, uh, from, from where, right? So, yeah, so then by symmetry, this is the same as n times the probability that you see half starting from first, uh, for first pepperoni piece. Yes, that means that when you scatter the pepperoni pieces, you can imagine that the position of the first pepperoni piece is fixed because uh, you can always rotate the pizza so that, for instance, the uh, pepperoni slice one is on the vertical line. You can rotate it, you know, just from pepperoni slice one, you swipe, right? If that's the, if that's the situation, then uh, then uh, what's the probability? So just find the location of what, wherever you throw the pepperoni slice, you might, without loss of generality, imagine it's on, on the vertical axis, let's say somewhere here, by just rotating the pizza so that you know, you understand what I mean, the pepperoni slice is here. And then uh, the other pepperoni slices are randomly distributed with its respect. So they must be on this half. And because the probability that they are on this half or on that half is one half, Yes, so the probability that two is on this half is one half times the probability that three is on that part is one half. So what do you get? You get n times one over two to the n minus one. Make sense? If this question can be puzzling. I mean, you have to, of course, be careful when you think about it, but you understand how I viewed it, right? I can always, uh, because it's on a pizza, I can always, wherever I throw the slices, I can always imagine that one uh, particular slice of the pepperoni is, let's say, always in the same location because I can rotate the pizza. It doesn't change anything, yes? So I uh, fix my attention on pepperoni piece one. And uh, I say, now what's the probability that all the other uh, pepperoni slices are on the right? All of them are on the right, right? Because I decided, if, because the condition is, if it's, if it's half the pizza, then there must be exactly one, uh, there exists one unique piece uh, such that all of them are, are, are uh, in contra clockwise rotation on the right. You understand? So don't get confused. I mean, you say, why just on the right? Maybe all of them are on the left. But but I made, if I said, given that it, it happened, it, it, the only way it can happen is that there would exist a unique uh, a unique uh, slice so that all of them are uh, on the, uh, on the cont counterclockwise rotation. Yes? So that is the answer. You probably can just, if you think about maybe uh, you always have to be worried, uh, is it fully right? You just always, just when, when, you, when you analyze it, be very careful. Maybe I didn't use the best symbols, but that appears to me uh, as the right answer to this question. That's what it is. Good. Now, number three. Number three is hopefully not a hard question. So what happens here? So the way I solve it, so we have this bacteria or amoeba that each moment uh, will decide whether to die or to divide into two or stay the same. So the question is, what's the probability that eventually everything is dead, the entire colony is dead? So then I define probability Pn to be probability of death given N bacteria. and bacteria or, or N cells, good? So what we're interested in is in probability one, probability that given that we start with one cell. So what is that equal to? So we use conditional probability, yes? So the probability it will die out, it's uh, one third, because it's equally likely to do any of those things. One third uh, times probability that it will die out if there are zero bacteria, which is obviously one because uh, we can define it this way, 
plus uh, divide into two, that's uh, one third, and now we have two bacteria. Yes? Plus uh, one third, and that's P1. Now, how can we simplify it? Now, we know that uh, each bacteria is behaving independently. So with two populations, it's the same as probability that uh, everything em emanating from one bacteria dies out times the probability anything emanating from the other bacteria dies out. So what is this? This is one third times one plus one third times P1 squared plus one third P1. And then when you solve it, you solve this equation, you obtain that P1 is equal to one, which means uh, with certainty, eventually the bacteria will be extinct. So far good? Now this, I wonder if I should uh, first skip question four because it involves Professor, yes, how uh, P2? Yeah, why is that uh, the case? That's a, that's a good mm -hmm. question. Why P2 uh, equals to yeah. P1 squared? Because uh, we are given that uh, um, independently, each, each, uh, each amoeba cell continues the cycle independently, which means uh, what you imagine is uh, if we have two bacteria, it's the same as uh, well, well, the probability that everything emanating from first bacteria dies out and everything emanating from the same bacteria or the second bacteria will die out. And because it's independent and it's just one probability multiplied by the other, right? Because what is P2? Uh, do I need to write it or you understand? Good professor, I understand. Okay, cool. All right, and now uh, for question four. So, I, I wonder if I should uh, skip it first or uh, because it involves a concept that is also used uh, in, in the, in the uh, extra credit question. Yes, maybe what I'll do is I'll skip question four and I will return to it later. I'll just solve the easy questions first. So you have the energy for maybe something that is more involving. So this question five is not too difficult. So uh, we have 52 cards and they are divided equally among four players. What's the probability that each player will receive 13 cards of the same suit? So what happens here is that uh, uh, we, can, we can make uh, a Kafka protocol, right? And the Kafka protocol is uh, what does player one receive, player two receive, so one, two, three, and four. Yes, good. One, two, three, four. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have the cards numbered. I mean, the, the, the suits numbered one through four, right? So uh, here you place uh, the numbers of the suits, what they get, right? So. You see, so so essentially, uh, once you say, let's say, uh, this gets one, this gets two, this gets three, this gets four, that means uh, you, you know which cards goes to each player. There are in general uh, four factorial possibilities here, and then uh, for each, for once this is set, you you know how to divide the cards. You know that uh, everything else is already understood. Now, in general, how many divisions are there into four players? They are 52, choose uh, 13, 13, 13, 13. So it's really in the, in the denominator, we have a different Kafka protocol for the uh, sample space. And in the sample space, there are 52, choose 13, 13, 13, 13. And so uh, here you have four factorial uh, possibilities for distributing the um, suits to players. Right from this from this protocol, right? So numerator, there are four factorial ways of doing it. Denominator. So in other words, in the numerator, there are four factorial ways uh, corresponding to the success, to the successful event, and altogether, this is how many outcomes are available. Good.
All right. So then uh, let's move on. Now, question number six is just an integration question, right? So you need to uh, calculate the expected value. Now, what, what do you have here? You have a stick. The stick notice is from zero to L. And somewhere on the stick, there is a point Q. I don't know where it is, but here is the point Q. And then you randomly break the stick. Let's say you randomly break it uh, here. That's the position X, right? You want to know the length of the piece that contains Q, okay? So then we know that the length given X is what? It's a function. Length given X is a function and what is this function? So it is L minus X if X as I drew in the picture is less than Q. You can say less than or equal, it doesn't matter. It will never in, in continuous probability never equal to Q. And what is it else? It's X if X is bigger than Q, yes? And then what's the density function? Uh, what's the uh, mass function at X? The mass function is one over L because it's uniformly distributed, right? So then what do you integrate? You integrate uh, from zero to Q of one over L uh, or one over L, L minus X dx plus the integral from Q to L of one over L X dx. Yes, and when you finish integrating it, you get, uh, what do you get? Well, you know, it's just, it's not important, right? From there, it's just uh, easy integral, I hope. I don't feel like uh, doing it, but just integrate it uh, if you set it. So a lot of you, uh, even if you set it up correctly, a lot of you forgot the one over L, maybe the bounds, something like that. Yeah, to divide by L, but you see why. I mean, either you, you do something else, you can actually change parameters. You can make it of length one, but then the point is not Q, but maybe change to uh, something in terms of L and Q. You can uh, remove the L, you just uh, do change of variables. It's okay as well. Uh, all right, and then uh, question seven, it's actually not a, not a hard question, but uh, some of you that solved it correctly did spend uh, a lot of energy on question seven. Yes, so what about question seven? So here we have 20 exams and people are seated in a circle. So once I press play, each person moves exam to the right or to the left. Right, so exams still remain on the table. Obviously, some people might have two exams, right? But uh, what happens? How many people here will remain without exam after this procedure if each is randomly moving exam to the left or to the right? So what we have here, we have uh, uh, indicator random variables x1 plus x2 all the way to x20. And xk equals to one means that he has no exam. If, uh, uh, if uh, uh, the person from uh, the, the people uh, on the side move the exam elsewhere, right? So uh, maybe I would not say even if it's too annoying to write it, but uh, this happens with probability one quarter. Do you agree? Because for the cave person not to get the exam, the person on the left must have moved it away from him. That's the probability of that is one half. And the person on the right must have moved uh, away from him. Again, probability is one half. So one quarter is the probability that uh, XK is equal to one. Now expected value, that's what we're interested in. Expected value is always additive, no matter independent or dependent, always additive, very important property, right? And so what is this? This is the same because they're identical, identically distributed variables. It's the same as 20 times the expected value of X1. And what's the expected value of X1? 
it's one multiplied by one quarter, right? So that's equal to 20 times one quarter and the result is five, you see? So without a lot of uh, effort, you get five. Good. Now, question number eight. An urn contains six white and 14 red balls. Five balls are taken out at random. What is the expected number of white balls in the sample? Very similar question. And one that you don't want to solve directly since you're asked ask about the expected value, you want to use uh, additivity. So what happens here, uh, we are taking uh, five balls. So there the are random variables, x1, x2, x5 uh, for, for the sample, right? So uh, x1 is going to give you indication it's one if I get a white ball and zero other ways, because I want to know how many white balls are in the sample, make sense? So what is the expected value here? Clearly they are distributed again, the same way as before. So it's really five expected value of X1, you agree? Because without, I mean, obviously it's not independent. If I take the balls one, uh, one by one, uh, the situation, if X1 is equal to one, it will affect what X2 can be. But if I look uh, just at, uh, at the second uh, ball withdrawn, it can be any ball, you agree? There is no preference uh, for what's the second ball. It can be any one of 20 balls. There are four, six white and 14 red. So any of the 20 balls, so it's five. And then uh, the probability that it is uh, one of the uh, white balls, it's uh, five multiplied by six divided by 20. So it's essentially a repeat of the previous question. And what do you get? You can uh, simplify it and you understand, right? It's just pretty much, uh, this is what you, what you have here. It's, um, yeah, good. So yeah, so that, that's, your, uh, that's your answer. Sure, Nicholas, even though uh, I do not know what, what, I mean, I will not get infected from, I think this way. So here is uh, the next question, question nine. Good, so question nine, we only need to find the density function of three X plus one, given that we have the density function for X. Yes, so there are several small mistakes that people made here. First of all, I need the uh, cumulative distribution of Y. I begin with the cumulative distribution of Y, which is what? Which is uh, probability that Y is less than or equal to little y. Yes, which is what? Which is the probability that three X plus one is less than or equal to Y. And that equals to the probability that X is less than or equal to Y minus one over three, agreed? And that equals to the cumulative distribution at X of Y minus one over three. And when I take the derivative with respect to Y, Take the derivative with respect to y, I get one third little f of y minus one over three. Yes, which translates to what exactly? So it translates to, uh, here is the function. So it translates to uh, one over, one over uh, six, one over six, uh, then we have here, um, y minus one divided by three. So it's one over 18. And, what, and the one thing is to mention is what is, x was between zero and, and uh, two, but what is y? y is between one and uh, seven, you agree? 
So here y is between one and seven, and that completes uh, completes this process. Agreed? Any questions on that? Very nice. Uh, now problem number 10. So we have Office of Entitlement for Santa Claus and uh, spoiled children are three times as likely to ask for four presents as to ask for two presents. It doesn't mean they only ask for four or for two presents. Do you agree? They can ask for infinitely, I mean, not infinitely, they can ask for a million presents. But uh, all we know about it is that uh, it's a, a Poisson a random variable. So I know that uh, the probability that uh, they ask for k presents is e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k divided by k factorial. Right, and then I'm and then I'm told uh, that uh, the probability that uh, they ask for four presents is three times the probability that they ask for two presents. Yes, so what do we get? So that means that uh, uh, e to the minus lambda, lambda to the power of four divided by four factorial is equal to e to the minus lambda times three. Uh, lambda squared over two factorial. So we can clearly cross away a lot of things here. Yes, so we can uh, cross away this, doesn't matter to us. And we can simplify the lambdas here. This is lambda squared. And uh, just do algebra here. So just multiply this by four factorial, right? And what do we get? We get uh, lambda squared is equal to um, three times four times three. That's it, right? I think I cross out the two. And uh, that is uh, what, 36, right? That's 36. And so lambda is equal to six. And uh, do you remember now, now you have to think, what's the expected value of a Poisson? It's lambda. What's the variance? Also lambda, right? So th there is no need to do too much more. The variance and expected value of a Poisson random variable is the same. So the answer is lambda equals to six. Many people got it right. Some people made the mistake of uh, putting the three on the other side, right? But I mean, you should think a sanity check Spoiled children want more presents than less presents. Yes, so it's uh, so of course they would. It's more likely that they would want four as opposed to two presents. Yes, and uh, we solved all the questions except for two involving uh, the extra credit. I mean, I mean three questions. And now we have we go back to uh, to the uh, question number three or something. No, question number four, sorry, right? So here, a lot of you used computer software or uh, other stuff, but you can do it absolutely uh, absolutely on your own, right? So without any software, you can ca calculate it for even large numbers. So first part is, so you have a, a sort of a banquet of 300 people. And uh, I suppose randomly 20 people uh, sampled which dishes will be served so that, you know, maybe the decision makers, we are assuming they are random people that might, of course, not be correct assumption. That's a big problem all the time when you apply anything, always wonder if the people ordering the banquet, are they just the same as the people that, that are coming around? Are they random? Yes. So. Uh, so we know that uh, 15 out of 20 prefer dish A to dish B. So they would uh, like dish A. And there is always, there's gonna be a choice between dish A and dish B. We just want to know how many dish A's we want to prepare, right? And out 15 out of 20 prefer dish A. That means what is our estimate for the probability? That's what we want to know. So 
how do you estimate this probability? So we know, first of all, that in, in, suppose that we have, uh, we have in general, we have this uh, distribution for the probability, whatever that might be. FP is distribution for probability. For capital P. So in other words, uh, uh, for capital P to equal to little p, that's uh, uh, that's with probability. That's approximately the probability. You see, it's the probability that the probability is uh, this. It's a bit meta in that sense, but I hope you understand what's the idea. We do not know the actual preference. We don't know the actual uh, probability uh, that uh, that a particular dish A is preferred, we just um, we just run an experiment and try to use that to gauge it, right? So so if in general, if the distribution is f of p, then uh, what is the single number that we could use to um, to assign to the probability, right? The probability that uh, that you know to to estimate the actual the actual probability of the preference. So what we can imagine is the way I th think of it is uh, uh, x uh, is uh, chance that next trial is successful. So in other words, x is either equal to one or zero, right? Now, if I do not know uh, the probability with which x is equal to one, I know that the probability that x equal to one is equal to some number p. You agree? That's, that's a, uh, that I don't, but I do not know what is this p. So what can I say? I can say, well, what's the probability that x equal to one given that p is equal to p. That would be not what I wrote. I'm sorry. Right? This 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 is uh, this is what I mean. Right? The probability that x equal to one, given that p is p, is this little p. Are you with me still? Because I might have confused you a lot. It's just based on just symbols. You see what I mean, right? So x equal to one, it could be 100% certain, it could be uh, never happening, right? Uh, but it, it, so if I know, in other words, x equal to one, I'm tossing a coin. This is an experiment. x equal to one, think of it as tossing a coin. In this case, like uh, dish A or not like dish A. One, if, if, if it's like dish A, and zero, if it does not like dish A. Yes, but I do not know anything about this particular creature. So this particular person. So I'm saying, well, I know it's going to be P if I knew the actual probability with which this person liked it, right? But uh, so so what, so then how do I figure out what's uh, x equal to one in general? So what is this? This is just the summation for all P of probability x equal to one given P equal to P times the probability uh, p equal to p. Do you agree? That's just a Bayesian rule, right? And, and what does it translate to? That translates to uh, the integral. This is the density function. So p probability that p is equal to p is approximately this, right? So that becomes now the summation is just the same as the integral. It's the integral over all values of p possible. So that's from zero to one. P is either zero or one or something in between. And uh, this is just P multiplied by FP dP. Do you see this? And do you recognize what this thing, this is the expected value. Expected value of the random variable P. You seeing that, right? Just, I mean, uh, you just look at this idea. Just try to see what uh, what is it that you are you're you're imagining. So I don't know the probability, but I see the distribution. I see the distribution. So so uh, the distribution means it's my estimate of the actual probabilities, right? And then I say, uh, uh, well, the probability x equal to one is the sum of uh, of all the possibilities. If x is one, given the probability is this, and x one, given the probability is something else, and this is what you get: the expected value. 
Yes. And uh, for our problem, for our problem, uh, it's it's what? So you, we can easily verify that the expected so so in this case the, the function is 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 beta. The function is is beta with uh, so so this function is beta uh, sixteen and uh, um, sixteen and uh, and and uh, the other, the other number is uh, what is five right sixteen five. Now uh, the expected value of this of this uh, is uh, I think it's going to be fifteen. Is going to be 16, if I'm not mistaken. The expected value of the beta distribution is uh, 16 divided by uh, 16 plus 5. Right? Or, or no, I think it's uh, plus 1, I think. Yes, like that, right? So that would be 16 over 22. This, if you want to, we can verify. Yes. So this probability is 16 out of 22. You can calculate it uh, uh, directly. It's not so hard to calculate. You don't need a, a computer for it. Yes, and that, and that is approximately 0 0.72. Are you with me guys? And uh, if you want afterwards, I mean, I, I can go over uh, calculating this number. It's not hard at all. You just you need to use combinatorics. You don't want to do the integrals. You want to use combinatorics. So the, the idea is actually, if you have an estimate, so this looks like 15 over 20, what you do is you add to the numerator one and add to the, to the 22, right? So it's, the, it's 15 plus one over 20 plus two. And that will give you an estimate of the, uh, of the actual probability. Okay, good. So uh, 0 0.72. And then the question is, what is the minimal number of dish A portions that the company should prepare in order to ensure that 99.9, that with 99.9 .9 certainty, that the um, demand does not exceed supply. Okay, so let's uh, clear this for a moment. So how to do that? So Really, it's a, it's now a binomial, right? We already know the probability of success. It's binomial with probability. So it's binomial. We assume it's binomial. We assume each person independently selects the dish. It's not completely true, obviously, but binomial and, uh, uh, and with probability uh, 0 0.72, I think. And, uh, and how many trials? 300 trials, right? So it's binomial with this probability in this many trials. And uh, any distribution is very well approximated, including the binomial, right? I mean, you can imagine it's, it's a binomial is a summation of uh, Bernoulli trials. It's first trial success or failure, second success or failure, right? So if you just add up random uh, variables, right? Then you can, uh, you can uh, they're each of them independent. It's very well approximated. The distribution of the sum is approximated by a normal curve. By that's what that's the central limit theorem. So what do you do? Well, you calculate the expected value. So what you have is you have uh, uh, probability. I want uh, this binomial, if this binomial is X, I want the probability that X is, um, so I, if I make N, I want the probability that X exceeds N to be less than uh, 0 0.001. That's what I want to estimate. I want N to be so that when X is bigger than N, this is the probability, yes? So uh, then I convert it to normal. How do I do that? I just uh, normalize it. I say, okay, X minus 300 times 0 0.72, I believe, divided by the, uh, the standard deviation. The standard deviation uh, happens to be what? It's uh, 300 multiplied by 0 0.72 
times uh, one minus 0 0.72, right? And that is bigger than uh, same thing you do to the other number here, the n, so it's n minus 300 times 0 0.72 divided by root of 300 times 0 0.72 times one minus 0 0.72. Yes, which in this number I will just indicate with an alpha. This is going to be alpha. Good. Now, that's the thing. You see, how do I arrive at this estimate? I just, uh, I, I mean, I just uh, imagine the binomial is just a sum of Bernoulli trials. And then I can just easily see that A, that the sum of independent identically distributed random variables uh, is approximated by, uh, by the normal curve. Right, so that, and then uh, I just convert the normal curve to uh, to the z-score, right? In other words, just uh, take uh, the, the average to be zero, that's the average, so subtract so it will be zero and divide by standard deviation to make it equal to one. And so what we get from here, we get from here that, uh, uh, I mean, we, we get another way to write the same thing is I want probability that z is less than or equal to alpha to be bigger than or equal to 0 0.999, yes? And if I look at the table, what is the value of alpha? The value of alpha is uh, going to be approximately uh, 3.09, yes? And then I look at the corresponding value uh, for the uh, cumulative distribution and I know that uh, what, what alpha should, well, I know alpha what it should be and then I just solve, of course, based on, I solve for n, you see? So I have that uh, n minus 300 times 0 0.72 divided by, uh, you know, this thing is equal to 3.09. And then I just solve for n, that gives me an estimate, right? So then my estimate of n that I arrived at uh, was about uh, 241. Make it 242 if you want, right? I mean, there are some, maybe some small uh, adjustments that you might kind of want to do that are statistically proper, but th those are kind of smaller questions. I mean, if you got an, an, an answer that's um, somewhere around 241, 242, uh, 243, even, I mean, I gave you either full credit or close to it, right? So that's how many dishes uh, you should make. You should not make 300, that would be wasteful. Good. This question, did I explain it clearly enough? I hope. All right. So now it's only up to the extra credit. All right. So the extra credit I even gave you uh, um, points false for if you solved question 11 and you did not use uh, what I think is important, uh, but you didn't use the, uh, the beta distribution because really the result you obtain uh, by using the beta or by not using the beta is going to be essentially identical, right? So very roughly speaking, this is an actual uh, Pfizer result. Uh, the emergency use of the vaccine was justified based on uh, uh, this observation. Now notice that they followed patients for only two months. In addition to many other things, I mean, you can talk about it, a cascade of things, but uh, we, ignore, uh, we ignore a lot of those things. We don't, we, we see there's, there's a first assumption is that all those people are somehow um, uniform. I mean, you see, so, I mean, the, the people that got sick from this, uh, from this uh, control group, the 169 people, they might not have been randomly uh, uh, sick out of the 20,000. You understand? They, a lot of people, they have this manufacturing mold, you know, it's very, very troublesome. I, I almost sometimes feel devastated when I see that in people is that they are in this mold. If, if a wall painter can uh, paint one wall in one hour, then two wall painters can paint two walls in one hour, right? They have this type of uh, arithmetic that they do, which is absolutely not applicable to real world. There is even a joke about it. Maybe you know it. If you have 
a, a, a well-abled uh, young man going to the forest to collect mushrooms. And, uh, uh, you know, he can collect 40 pounds of mushrooms a day. And a beautiful young lady uh, that's can, that can collect 20 pounds of mushrooms a day it doesn't mean that if they go to the forest that they will collect, that they would collect um, 60 pounds of mushrooms together. You understand? And people don't get it. Uh, they, they, they think that uh, people are like cans, like, like, like every situation is identical, standard. And they think the same thing about education. I mean, every school, I mean, they have this core curriculum, teach this, 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 and this, teach this, 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 and this. So they want to program a person to just be making uh, those same repeated moves. Yeah. So anyhow, back to this question. So eliminating all of those things, uh, uh, there are so many things to kind of, uh, the probabilities and statistics are therefore very difficult. This is what happened. So what they did is they entirely ignored uh, uh, the uh, control and and the, um, the placebo group and the uh, drug group, and they just uh, saw, okay, we have 169 uh, people that got uh, COVID uh, without vaccine and only nine in the control group, right? Now, then they say that uh, the efficiency is 95%. Now, what is that 95%? So the way I understand it, that's what I mentioned, that's my interpretation is imagine the vaccine would have been like a drug. In other words, those people that, those 169 people that uh, uh, were sick, if you injected each and every one of them with a the drug, they will recover or not get sick. Doesn't matter what you think of it. I prefer to think for mathematically, mathematically, I prefer to think inject this vaccine and they recover. So all but nine of them will recover. Right. So uh, what do you, what it means? Oh, but um, nine of those uh, participants will recover. So what you do is uh, 169 minus nine, because those nine are supposed to be now, although they are part of the uh, of the other group. You, what I imagine is when you subtract the nine, it's like it's like uh, those are the nine from this group uh, from well, that will not recover when you inject it. Understand? Because the, the 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 people you just imagine them to be the same, right? So it's as if it's the same universe, but here we, we had six one hundred sixty nine people that got sick, and uh, and and, and uh, in one universe they received medicine, in the other they didn't. In the universe where they received medicine, uh, all but nine recovered, or were not we did not show symptoms, right? So this divided by uh, by one hundred sixty nine. That means that's the probability without doing anything. That that's a, that's an approximation of the probability that um, that. So it's it's really it's really this number. It's really one hundred and sixty divided by one hundred sixty nine, and that's approximately the probability that uh, that uh, that those people would have been helped by this medicine, recovered, or whatever the definition of symptomatic or not, or whatever this thing is. Yes. Uh, now, uh, I mean, a better solution would have been uh, a little better is to say 161 divided by 171. Uh, but it's very similar. So, right, this is using beta. If you use beta, it's more, uh, this is a bit, because it's not the, true that 160, you know, it's not, that's not what we observed. We just, we, we just, we just imagined Again, is it, is it even right to imagine? We have we imagine we had 169 trials, and out of those trials, uh, we had 160 successes, right? So you have this ratio, and that's uh, the 95% uh, or 94 point something, you know, right? This, those numbers are very similar, so I gave you a full score, but this is the beta distribution, because I don't know that this is the probability. This is just experimental, so maybe I think the probability is this, yes? Because I think that I had 169 trials and only, no, not only, in 160 60 successes. Are you with me? All right. Now, yes, good. I actually thought of a very good question. It's too bad I didn't ask it, but on the exam, something more subtle than that, right? You know. In other words, uh, maybe I'll send it to you, to you if you want to. I, I haven't worked on the numbers, but uh, you know, essentially, imagine uh, that um, that let's say vaccine has a side effect, and the side effect is milder than uh, the disease, as people say, right? The vaccine has side uh, side effect; it's milder than the disease, and it is very effective against the disease. Does it always mean uh, that you should take the vaccine? 
right? That would be my uh, probability question. If you're interested, maybe I'll send it to you and say, write the numbers. You see, I'm saying it just you know, it is, the, the vaccine maybe is 100% effective or medicine, 100% effective, but there is a side effect sometimes. And the side effect is less frequent than the disease. Does it mean that, uh, you know, right? Maybe bad, I don't know, but less frequent uh, than the disease. Does it mean that, it's, that you want to take the vaccine? Always, right? And that's the question I think I'll, I have, right? So, all right. And here we have uh, a part B of the same question is just uh, uh, if, if you're in, the, uh, in this group, based on this information, if you're in this group, what's your probability of actually contracting the disease? You see? So based on, uh, on this information, I'm solving B. I just want to write it here. So roughly speaking, uh, if I, I, I can take uh, 100, uh, 170, the probability of contracting the disease, if you don't do anything, don't have any intervention according to this uh, experiment is estimation. It's 170 for this two months, for this season. You know, it's different for different seasons. 170 divided by... Uh, 2174, I think, right? Which is, of course, very similar to doing uh, to not changing anything, but just taking the ratio 169 to 2172, right? This is just using the uh, binomial, and this is versus uh, in the placebo group, it would be 10 divided by um, 19967, I believe. Yes, and those numbers are not as very as different. They, you know, one is like ninety five percent, wonderful. This one is just, uh, uh, I think, one of them is uh, zero point eight, the other one is zero point four, or something like that. You can calculate. Good. And so far, any questions? Nicholas, are you alive? And now, uh, final question. Now, somebody, uh, so, so uh, this is, uh, as far as I know, I can tell you where the numbers are and how you calculate them, right? Uh, there are different people telling you different things. So for instance, there are some people that tell you that uh, mortality from COVID is uh, 5% or 3%. And you know, uh, you, have, you have millions of people or 1% or whatever uh, nonsense. You see, this is, a table of mortality and uh, the at least the data that I trust is uh, from Michael Levitt. I can give you a link for that. And uh, you know he he made his analysis already based on uh, based on uh, the Diamond Princess, which was uh, pretty reliable. Diamond Princess analysis because it's essentially like an experiment where you have everyone in confined environment where everyone is exposed to the virus and where you can massively test everything, like the full population, supposedly, right? You have the full ship and you can massively test it and you can kind of estimate uh, something on that, right? And he adjusted uh, the predictions to uh, populations. He made a mistake, I forgot what was the initial mistake. And some people, if you look at look him up, they would say, well, he made previous mistakes, but that's propaganda. He is tremendously good at predicting what happened in Florida. Uh, he's very good at, uh, and he has very accurate, as far as I can tell, as accurate as you can get, uh, information about excess mortality, right? So, so such numbers also obtained by Ioannidis, John Ioannidis and, uh, and Michael Levitt. And this is, uh, you can see uh, the survival rate, at least assuming that all those people are identical. So every person from zero to 19, somehow is supposed to be identical, right? You have those categories. And of course the disease becomes more dangerous as you get older, right? You can have for after 69, it's not in a stable, but you have, uh, as you get older, it's more dangerous. For people that are 80, it's definitely much more dangerous, but any diseases, right? And then uh, this chart, 
uh, Israeli cases that has to do with spread. So uh, because uh, young people, let's say people in the category from zero to 19, and then from 20 to 29, and even from 30 to 39, and you might even argue uh, in this category, but you know, uh, why should those people get vaccinated if uh, their likelihood of suffering from this disease is not comparable to even the flu, especially this group, right? They suffer much worse from the flu. Why should they get vaccinated? And still every time you hear that it's because they need to prevent the spread to others. Yes, and then here is a chart from Israel uh, you might try to type this in and maybe it's not working, but I speak Hebrew. I collaborated with this chart. I, I, call, I, I can tell you the chart is true from several sources. There is a study that I have in, in a link that says pretty much a similar thing. And uh, I saw Israeli mainstream news where at least one of those categories uh, is indeed so. Right? They, I think they, they spoke uh, of, of one of those categories. I didn't uh, verify it through those sources, as maybe they were deleted. I'm not sure what happened, right? But uh, it's believable that this chart is true to me at least. So what's the situation here, guys? This is, uh, this is the spread, right? Now, uh, this is the population that was vaccinated at this time. And this is uh, uh, the percent of cases. Yes. Now, what would you expect? Let's say so. So you have this claim, for instance. Some people uh, they 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 have those those charts about proportions. Uh, so uh, so if something does not uh, do any, if the, if this medicine is not doing anything for in this regard, what what should you see? If you have fifty percent vaccinated and fifty percent not vaccinated, you should see as many cases in both. Do you agree? If it does nothing, correct. If you have, let's say, 80% people vaccinated, right? Uh, then uh, how the percentage of cases should be, uh, so it should be exactly proportional. 80% of the cases should be from the vaccinated. You agree? If there is proportion. Are you with me, guys? Uh, you, this, is the, this is what I'm trying to see if I can. In other words, you're looking at this table, it's very easy to see how effective it is uh, according to this table against uh, stopping the spread of the disease. Do you see it? You just, this is not important. All you have to look at is at this column and at this column and compare each category, each category. Yes? Now, are you following what I'm saying? So imagine you take a placebo uh, pill, right? And somebody, and somebody takes a medicine, right? And uh, the medicine is not effective against the disease. What are you going to see? You're going to see that uh, all the people that get sick are equally likely to be in one population as opposed to the other population. If, if there is the same number of uh, people in each group, do you agree? If for instance, there are 50% vaccinated people, 50% not vaccinated, then 50% uh, of cases will be in the vaccine group if it's not effective in this category, yes? Now, what happens if you have 80% uh, vaccinated and 20 not vaccinated, right? What happens then you should see if there is no effect, you should see 20% of cases uh, in the unvaccinated and 80% uh, in the vaccinated. It, it rises proportionally to the population because you understand it, it's, just, it's, just, it, it's just the uniform distribution, right? The more area a given uh, region occupies, the more likely you are to hit in that area. And it's proportional to this uh, to the uh, size of the interval, so to speak. Makes sense. So exactly pro this uniform distribution proportional to the size of the interval. With me, because I say interval area, I'm hoping I'm not confusing you by switching from two dimensional uh, uh, to one dimensional, right? It's, it's it's best to say one dimensional is this, right? If I have let's say this is twenty percent, and this is eighty percent. Then, uh, the, then every time I, I do the random experiment, 80% of the time, the outcome is in here and 20% of the time, the outcome is in here. That's what happens here, right? Now, what do you, what, what do you see? That means that look at this number, 77% uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, this, is, this is the cases and 71, which means that it's even more, you see, it should be around 72 here, should be 72 here, do you agree? But it's even more. 
what do you, what should you see here? It should be 77. That's approximately similar. Let's say this is exactly like uh, random. It means that it has no effect. This it even seems to, uh, to, to indicate that, uh, that people that are vaccinated are spreading the disease with higher frequency. Yes? You see, because this number is bigger than this number. And let's look at all other categories. So uh, in this category, it's the same. This is, well, this is more or less the same. This is slightly more. So it does look like 40 to 49 year olds that are vaccinated spread the disease slightly more than, uh, uh, than the unvaccinated. Because you see, those numbers should be the same if it's equal and, and you still have more hits here. More hits here, more hits here, more hits here, more hits, you see? And of course, in this category, it's slightly less. So 80 to 89 year olds seem to be slightly less spreading if they're vaccinated than if they are not because it, now this number is smaller than the other right and the same is in the 90 plus year old but all other categories seem to be spreading it even more when they are vaccinated it could be the bicycle helmet effect so they think they are impervious and they begin uh, you know doing other things and uh, and uh, engage in activity that spreads it slightly more essentially this uh, seems to mean that there is no uh, no reason to that at all there is no it's absolutely not true and this is not just an experiment, this is the entire population. It's absolutely false to say that this thing prevents spread. Yes? Interesting. And, uh, uh, and then, um, well, hopefully very. I mean, it's, it's worse than that, I mean, right? And then, uh, of course, uh, this thing, which, is, which I find very funny, the, the, the assessment of damage of the vaccine is very you know people think are so linear you see one thing that they think is oh this vaccine is not very damaging but they forget that this massive campaign to vaccinate people prevents people from getting other vaccines or other medical treatment there are people that uh, develop brain tumors because uh, they are not diagnosed in time because you know you just have to inject uh, vaccination every moment every every second and flood the hospitals Right, uh, and uh, not to mention that I mean, uh, uh, you lock people down, they lose the ability to work, they get poor, and then you they also fire medical uh, staff that don't want uh, this procedure, and then you have fewer fewer people treating things. So it is it's not ever a simple question. You know, so they, they initially that's my first thought when they started the lockdown is uh, I believe the virus is to be very dangerous initially, at least uh, I didn't believe any, any measures will do anything against it, but I thought it's possibly a dangerous virus. But I, but I wondered how is it that, uh, you know, the simplest way to, to stop the spread of the disease is to kill everyone. And they don't spread anything, but that does not help with, uh, with living, right? The, the most efficient vaccine is just kill everyone. Then they will not produce any viruses. Right. You, you, you might minimize uh, one thing and then create the, make the problem terrible in a different region. That's just one problem. But even within the vaccine group, uh, this is roughly what, what is coming through. This is this question I gave you uh, mostly for this part. I gave full credit. I even gave quite a lot of full credit for all of it, even if I did not agree with what people uh, wrote and, and said. So this is what uh, they say about it. Right. So they say, um, well, the risk, the risk of an, uh, on an unwanted and serious side effect after corona inoculation is very small. It resides in the vicinity of 0.02% and thereby affects one in every 5,000 people on average. That's what they claim according to, uh, according to this uh, brochure. So now I, I think it's pretty interesting. This is average. Right, average might pass. It's hard to say where the average goes. It's hard to do anything, and it's true. If anybody said this is meaningless, right? I mean, but this is said is meaningless. I mean, neither good nor bad. But uh, average, you might imagine children that are not getting very sick, they are at a very low risk. People that are getting more sick, maybe in a, you know, there is different risk. And apparently, uh, you, if you look at where was that chart? If you look at this chart, look at this age group, right? Uh, this is uh, about 10 times less. In other words, uh, the risk to this age group from the disease is, is probably 10 times less. So my uh, rough opinion about this thing is, yes, probably the risk from the vaccine, at least within the first uh, year, is very low for young uh, people. In other words, I don't know anybody, uh, at least me personally, I don't know anybody that was damaged by it in any way, but 
it appears by this information that uh, injecting this thing, you just will kill 10 times more people uh, than it would be helped, uh, at least in the age group from zero to 19. Right, not a lot, but 10 times more. Good. Any questions, anything else? Because we finished uh, the exam earlier than uh, I imagined, it's nice. Okay, well, guys, uh, then all right, thank you, thank you, Jacob. All right, guys, Nicholas, and everyone, if you have no questions, I bid you farewell. I told you if you're interested, I might send you this question about this probability once I write the numbers. All right, I told you it. Right? If the vaccine is uh, very effective, that's the probability question, right? Uh, very effective, and the side effect is not as bad as the disease, does it mean that you should take it? Is it good uh, in terms of your health to still take it? And I'm gonna write this question uh, we'll, and then uh, we'll see. Hmm. All right, guys, then uh, goodbye. Have a good, happy new year, uh, if it, it's possible. Yes, I could figure that. Uh, yes. So go have enjoy enjoy your private life. Be happy. Be merry. And uh, yeah, goodbye. Take Thank care. you very much. Take care, Professor. Take we'll care. Take care. Thanks. From you. And thank you very much for the wonderful semester, really. This was very enlightening. This was mm -hmm. good stuff. I hope so. It was. It, it really was. Mm -hmm. All righty. Good night. See good you guys. Night. Best of luck. Good night. Good night. Thank good you night. very much. It's not too patient. All right. Uh, same here. Thanks for the semester, Professor. This was pretty fun. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you for, I don't know, sure. Uh, it, yeah, good, or you appeared. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, may, if I may say, uh, thankfully, well, maybe I'll be infected with a computer virus now. I don't. Know. I don't <laughs> Digital virus. Well, uh, how are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling okay. Um, it's uh, it, at first, um, I, I didn't feel very well, but now it's uh, getting better. Oh, I'm glad I was able to have this placebo effect on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, uh, like, like Jacob said, thanks for the semester. It was pretty fun. Um, it was uh, enjoyable getting to learn math from a different angle. <laughs> Very different angle? What, what is the usual angle? The usual angle? I don't know. Like uh, more traditional problems, I think, and explanations. Ah, so my pro my explanations are not traditional, you're saying? Not as traditional, <laughs> at least for me. I don't know. Maybe the people you're around, it's traditional, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyways, yeah. Thanks, Professor. Well, Edmund. good luck with everything, uh, Nicholas. Keep in touch if you want. Of course. All right. right. See you. You're supposed to learn Russian, right? Improve your Russian, to be precise. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Я считаю, не так плохо. Не, не ужасно, но нужно говорить, ну, не как иностранец, нужно говорить по-русски и читать по-русски. Да, я согласен. Окей, все, до свидания. До свидания.